Given that most of us sleep, or try to sleep, for six to ten hours each day, it makes our choice of sleeping gear kind of important. At home, it's fairly straightforward. Mattress, pillows, sheets, maybe a blanket or two, and a comforter or bedspread. But when we're out camping, things are a little more specialized. Learn about the history of the sleeping bag and check out some of the samples we have in the collection of the National Scouting Museum in this edition of Artifact of the Week. For thousands of years, man kept warm while sleeping on the ground wrapped in the hides of various animals. When it got colder, he added more or heavier hides to keep the chill away. As time advanced, people began to develop and refine textiles, eventually replacing hides with clothing and blankets made of fabric. Again, as the temperatures dip, we add an additional blanket or a clothing layer. It's a fairly simple system and it worked. In 1861, Francis Tuckett, then Vice President of the English Alpine Society, took a cloth blanket and applied a rubber waterproofing substance to the outside of it. This coating provided additional insulation as it not only kept the inside dry, but it made it wind resistant as well. Tuckett continually tested his new Alpine bag and made modifications to the design, advancing the idea of the sleeping bag forward. Fifteen years later, in 1876, Price Jones, a Welsh businessman known as a pioneer in the mail order business, patented the first commercially produced sewn blanket sleeping bag, which included a sewn-in airtight pillow. While no known samples of his bag survived history, a recreated sample is on display at the Newtown Textile Museum in Mid Wales. Records indicate he contracted to sell 60,000 of his sleeping bags to the Russian army although only 43,000 were delivered because the Russians canceled the contract early. Following the cancellation of the Russian contract, Jones set out to advertise the sleeping bag as an excellent bed for the poor. Documents show the British Army also bought his sleeping bags, but the actual number is uncertain, and missionaries in Africa and pioneers in the Australian outback bought his sleeping bag as well. The idea of an insulating sleeping bag came about with the demands of exploration and mountaineering. In 1888, a Norwegian explorer, Nansen, planned to ski across Greenland. In preparation for this adventure, he and five of his friends spent time living with the Inuits of Lapland to learn how they coped with the extreme cold. Nansen noticed that the Inuits slept under sealskin blankets, and he sewed some together, making three-person sleeping bags that they would use on their trip. Nansen's crossing started on August 15th and lasted until October 3rd, 1888. Following this adventure, Nansen worked with a Norwegian company to make the first commercially available and produced insulated sleeping bags using kapok, a plant-based material, as a stuffing. The company, which had been manufacturing wadding since 1855, also used kapok as a mattress filling. Camel hair, a hollow fiber, was also a popular choice in these early insulated bag designs. In 1892, the first down or feather-filled sleeping bags appeared as a choice for insulated sleeping bags. While historically the rectangular-shaped sleeping bag was the norm, in the 1930s the sarcophagus-shaped mummy bag was developed. The mummy bag design reduces its volume and surface area, which improves its heat retention properties. Most mummy bags do not unzip all the way to the feet, because the zipper is the weak point in any sleeping bag's insulating qualities. Another heat retaining feature is a drawstring at the head end of the sleeping bag to help prevent the escape of warm air. In 1933, a Frenchman, Pierre Alain, introduced the elephant foot, a short sleeping bag that joined to a down jacket, both of which were covered by a waterproof silk outer bag. This waterproof outer bag was later shortened to become the lightweight rain parka. In 1937, synthetic fibers were developed that replicated the natural fillings already being used. These new fibers didn't migrate through the covering fabric, and they retained much greater insulation values even when wet. Finally, they were much less expensive to produce. During the 20th century, sleeping bag design focused mostly on the warmth to weight ratio, reducing weight while increasing heat retention. Matching down filling insulation with outer shell fabric such as Pertex or Gore-Tex helped give adventurers the best of both worlds. 
Sleeping bag systems also came on the scene as multi-season sleeping bags using a light inner shell, a heavier outer bag, and a lightweight waterproof and wind resistant cover to increase or decrease the temperature at which the sleeping bag is effective. For the Boy Scouts, the first mention of sleeping bags in Boys Life magazine, and it's really more of a do-it-yourself camping without tents article, is in the August 11th issue of Boys Life. It talks about camping the Scout way, light, and using your blanket to create a kit of everything you need to be comfortable in the outdoors, as long as the weather's good. In the December 1914 issue of Boys Life magazine, there is official advertising for a variety of ponchos, waterproof blankets, and capes that can also be used as sleeping bags. These ads are also the first mention of the bed blanket. In the collection of the National Scouting Museum, we have several official BSA sleeping bags from the 1940s and 1960s. We also have a couple of non-BSA bags, such as this Eureka Silver City bag, introduced in the early 20 teens, and this 1950s era comfy sleeping bag that was manufactured by the Seattle Quilt Manufacturing Company. As you can see from the tags, it is filled with Dacron, a fiber developed by DuPont and introduced in 1951. According to this original tag, Dacron ranks right below down and ahead of nylon, wool, and kapok in terms of its ability to retain heat. In researching the history of the sleeping bag, I did come across several interesting designs that while they don't seem practical for most scouting activities, could certainly be fun from a thematic point of view. For example, there is the bear and elk sleeping bags that might be appropriate for family camping at the Philmont Training Center. There's also the shark themed sleeping bag we could offer for a sea base themed outing. For the musically inclined, there are these sleeping suits with a built-in sound system and for ultralight campers, we have the jack pack, which converts from a raincoat to a sleeping bag and ultimately a tent with bug netting. There's also the polo backpack, which appears to convert into a sleeping coat with integrated bug protection for your head. And finally, there's the cocoon hanging sleep system. Now this particular product was originally developed for use in refugee camps, but has found a place in the solo camping community and is a favorite with the UFO hunters from what I've read. Not sure it would be such a great idea here at Philmont, as bear lines can already get crowded and the challenges of hoisting your entire crew into the air could certainly stretch even those crews that seem to really have it all together. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Join us next time as we continue to learn more about the history of the BSA through the collection of the National Scouting Museum and Artifact of the Week. <laughs>